Well, welcome everybody to the University of Adelaide's Open Day. Thank you for braving the elements in coming to what I hope you will all find both an enjoyable and informative event. For many in the audience, this will be your first such Open Day in this university. And I'll let you into a secret, this is also my first Open Day at the University of Adelaide because uh, I took up this role as the Dean of Medicine earlier this year, having previously worked in the United Kingdom. And as such, as Dean of Medicine, I have responsibility for the medical program in this university. And this morning's session is very much about giving you some information about what we do uh, in uh, education um, and training our medical students in this uh, university, but it's also about giving you a clear picture about what you need to do if you want to enter medical school. It's always a great pleasure to be able to uh, talk to an audience of enthusiastic students who are interested in pursuing a career in medicine. I vividly remember my first day at medical school. It was full of excitement, some trepidation, but also pride. I was proud to be entering such a marvelous profession, albeit that that was the very earliest stage of that. But that sense of pride has not diminished over the years, but with it comes a sense of real privilege. And that's because of, uh, medicine offers such a myriad of professional opportunities, but all really have one thing in common, and that's that they are all about improving the health and well-being of others. So it can be incredibly rewarding, but can, it can also be incredibly demanding. And by that, I don't just mean the long hours that doctors often have to work, but the fact that it is ever-changing. Medicine never stands still. So the years that you spend as an undergraduate is really just the first part of a journey which is characterized by lifelong learning. So I think it's for those, that, that reason that I think there are three important questions you need to ask yourselves if you are indeed considering uh, entering medical school. First of all, do I really want to be a doctor? And by that re really I mean what is the life uh, of a doctor really like? Some of you might well have a good sense of that in that your parents may be doctors or friends of your parents may be doctors or other relatives may be doctors. And you have had the opportunity to speak to them about what it's like about being a doctor. Others may not have that direct contact and I would certainly always encourage those who are planning to, to uh, apply for medical school that they talk to doctors at all different levels. Talk to medical students, talk to junior doctors who have fairly recently graduated. Find out what the good bits are and also what the bad bits are about being a doctor. The second question that we've got up here that I think you need to ask yourselves is how do I get there? If, if you've decided, yes, medicine is definitely for me, I understand it's going to be demanding, but it will be rewarding, how do I get there? That really, um, relates to there being different pathways to ultimately graduating from medical school. And I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. And those different pathways will suit individuals differently. The last question about is this the right um, program for me is more related to not the pathway, but the type of learning style that the individual medical schools offer. And they are very different. And the type of, of learning style uh, at one university will suit some uh, students better than others. So, second question then is, how do I get there? And really there are three, essentially three pathways to graduating uh, a, a, from medical school and then becoming an intern and moving on into postgraduate life. The first is what's described as direct entry programs. And by that I mean you go straight from school into a program which goes right through to uh, receiving a degree, hopefully, um, and graduating as an MBBS enabling you to enter uh, the internship. There are other uh, programs where you, first of all, enter into uh, a, a first degree and then transfer a later date into a graduate program. And then finally, the other pathway is to undertake a completely different um, degree in the first instance, such as a Bachelor of Health Science, and then apply at a later stage to a graduate entry program. Now, 
Ours is a direct entry program, and I said that means you go straight from school into a program which stretches six years, ultimately, uh, if everything goes well, graduating with an MBBS. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that this is my first uh, open day here, and I spent the last uh, 23 or more years in a university in England, one of the best medical schools there, and when I was there, I had a great um, opportunity just to understand what was going on around that country and in uh, mainland Europe in terms of medical education. So I think I can very confidently say that I can, uh, I can pitch... University of Adelaide against all those different programs. And I can say with great confidence that this is of the highest quality program uh, for medical education. So I think we've got lots to be proud of in our program here. Um, we aim to... Um, a, it's, sorry, it's a program which uh, has evolved over many years. It continues to evolve. And that's because, as I said earlier, medicine never stands still. And our aim is to have graduates that are the highest possible quality medical practitioners in an ever-changing healthcare workforce. We aim very much to ensure that our graduates are work-ready. They can go into the uh, internship and hit the ground running. They gain experience in a range of settings and are exposed to high-quality academics and researchers and excellent clinical teachers around healthcare sector in South Australia. I've put up here the characteristics of our current program. It, in the initial stages, it's very much a case-based learning uh, a structure. That's the, the dominant learning mode. This case-based learning um, exposes the students to aspects of medicine from day one. So the learning around uh, structures and functions are put in the context of clinical cases. In year one, there is an underpinning uh, a, a basic biology course which provides a great platform on which to build those clinical-based, uh, sort of case-based learning and clinical, um, uh, clinical uh, skills training. We very much encourage students to be self-directed learners. So we, we equip them to be able to learn by themselves with appropriate support from our academic community. We have a program which also has exposure to rural and remote medicine. And indeed, our rural school is a very successful part of what we do. And 25% of our um, undergraduates spend one year in the rural school. Throughout the first three years, where a lot of the training, the learning is uh, in the medical school building, uh, currently in Frome Road, but in the future, at the other end of the, uh, of the North Terrace, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment, it's very much around small group learning. Clinical teaching, as I said, starts from day one, and clinical skills training, um, how to take histories, how to communicate with patients, starts in the very earliest stages of the program. And we have an integrated uh, approach, as I mentioned. This is not about just teaching anatomy separately from physiology and so on. It's around cases and around uh, a, a, a parts of the, of the, the body and, and parts of our uh, disease processes. And then the last point that's on this slide is a very important one. That's around interprofessional learning. Nowadays, high-quality health care is not delivered by doctors in isolation. Doctors are part of health care teams. They work closely in those teams with other health care professionals, with nurses, with physiotherapists, and so on. And increasingly, we're focused on developing those teamwork skills and leadership qualities in our undergraduates to equip them as good leaders in the future. And one of the real um, opportunities ahead of us in developing that interprofessional learning even further is this building here. This is an artist's impression of a really exciting development which will take place at the other end of North Terrace. This is the so-called um, integrated clinical school uh, which will be adjacent to the new Royal Adelaide Hospital and SAMRI, the research institute. And construction of this will begin early next year. And Together, that will form one of the largest health precincts in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Because it's going to be built uh, from next year, those who enter our program in 2014 will get some of their learning in this uh, fantastic facility. It will have within it state-of-the-art clinical skills, training facilities, and simulation facilities. It will be digitally enabled, and it will house the schools of medicine, nursing, and dentistry. And it's that platform that will allow us to do more around the interprofessional learning and teamwork uh, skills. So I mentioned that a lot of this today is, this session is supposed to be about letting you know what you need to do to get into medical school. And at this juncture, I want to hand over to Beverly Car Carafa, who knows all the technical details and can and talk you through what it is you need to do uh, at this stage if you want to, uh, to, to join us. Thank you very much, Professor Bett, and um, I'd like to offer my welcome to you all here on a very, very wet and rainy day, but I'm glad you're all here to, to sort of hear about some of the more technical uh, details of applying for medicine. It can be a bit off-putting, it's quite complicated, but really just ask questions, make sure you're informed, make sure you're comfortable with all the knowledge, uh, you know, all the information that you need. So the first bit of information I'm going to, to sort of suggest you make sure you have your heads around are the types of uh, entry uh, uh, categories and the types of places in the program. So as you see on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, we've basically got three different categories that you can, that you can uh, be ad admitted into the program under. Firstly, and probably uh, the biggest in number, is our school leaver category. So basically that's somebody who's completed or is in the process of completing year 12 and will have an ATAR score. That ATAR score needs to be over 90. And even if you do sort of decide to take a gap year and you haven't started any other any university study, you can still apply the following year uh, using that ATAR and be considered a school lever, okay? Um, so, uh, some people, instead of using uh, an ATAR, will use a STAT score, so that's like uh, for what in my day was called a mature age entry into uni, or I think some Year 12 students are sitting STAT tests as a backup for their ATAR. So that, all of those types of applicants coming in with those sort of results, IB results as well, will be considered under this school lever category. If you're coming in and you have already started uni, I would say it would have to only be university study here at the University of Adelaide, any degree, but you've started a university study here. Um, it can be any course. We've had students apply for medicine from uh, courses as varied as music, commerce, law, engineering, a wide range. What they do need to make sure is that you've done at least a year full-time study here at the University of Adelaide and achieve a grade point average, that's your university grades, of 5.0 or higher, okay? That's your minimum threshold is this credit or better grade point average, okay? Um, if you have any more questions about either of those pathways, of course, come down to the, the lawns and ask us after the, the lecture, uh, this talk. But one pathway that we do have that um, is, uh, uh, you know, recently sort of formalised in our uh, uh, univers uh, university and program is rural background entry. So what we are saying is students who have spent five or more years since the beginning of primary school in a rural area can apply for this um, dedicated number of seats in our program and be competing only against other rural background students for those seats. So that's our rural background entry. Um, it, it may mean that there's sort of slightly different sort of cut-off points and things, but you're only competing against other students from a similar background. And some students take great, applicants take great comfort in that. We do have to have, as every university, 25% of 
of our cohort needs to be from a rural background. But um, as well as that way in, once you do get in, there are different types of places you could be sitting in. All of them are Commonwealth supported places for domestic students, for Australian citizens. We have a Commonwealth supported place, kind of standard Commonwealth supported place, unbonded. You come into the program, you study, you pass, you come out with a great hex step at the end. Okay. Um, we also have what we call a medical rural bonded scholarship place. A few of these scholarships exist where you come into the program and as well as um, studying in our six year program, you have your, uh, uh, your study hex debt paid as you study and you also get a small living allowance um, as you study during the six years. Of course, there is a bond then to return your service in a rural area when you're completed, but you've had the benefit of the scholarship monies and uh, place as you studied. And the final type of place is what we call a bonded medical place. Now, a number of years ago, the Commonwealth Government made some extra places available in medical schools around the country. And by way of well, saying thank you for one of a better description, um, they've asked that people who have sit in this seat return their service, the year that they've studied, in an area of need. Not necessarily rural, but it depends what sort of area you go into afterwards. But you return the service that the Commonwealth uh, Government has allowed you to uh, study uh, in return for allowing you to study. There's a lot of sort of complicated information about that, but if I can make you aware of it, that that's something you really do need to sort of research and be comfortable with the information about all those different types of places um, when you're applying for medicine, and especially at the time that offers are made. But speaking of applying, um, there is there is quite a lengthy process to it. Of course, you need to sit the UMAT test. Now, I think some of the year 12s in the audience sort of just sat that a couple of weeks ago, and I really do wish you good luck with your results. But uh, your next step now is to put your formal application in through SATAC online, and uh, if, you, if you're still at school, you can ask your uh, counsellors to help you navigate that process. Um, if not, uh, SATAC themselves will be able to guide you through it. Once all those applications are received and we get UMAT scores, the next step will be, hopefully, that you're invited to attend an oral assessment, which is the next step. It's like an interview. But the oral assessments are held at the end of the year or in the last week of January and are the next step in the process. So after the oral assessments, I would absolutely make sure you are completely informed, comfortably informed about the different types of places that you know, may come your way because the next stage after that will be the offers. Now they come out, they start coming out for domestic student applicants in the middle of January is I think the first round of SATAC offers. Uh, and then we actually Go th we actually continue to make offers right through until, you know, even February, you know, late February, uh, just to make sure we get the exact right number of students into the program. But once you do accept your offer, um, there are a few things that you'll need to make sure uh, that you're uh, aware of and have organised before you start the program, but I'll go through that in a minute. Okay. So let's go into each of those elements in a bit more detail. So the SATAC application deadline, I think it's the 27th of September. So we, for medicine, do not accept any late applications after that. Some other programs, like a Bachelor of Arts, you can put in a late application and still be considered. But unfortunately, because we've got so much else to sort of get going, we can't accept late applications to the medicine program. When you do, uh, put your SATAC application in, you'll be applying under a SATAC code and it's written on the website, but it's 314552. 
Now, now applicants who want to apply during, uh, via the rural background will also have to submit within 10 days of sort of clicking submit on the SATAC website, what we call a statutory declaration. And that basically is just sort of affirming and, you know, promising that you do meet the criteria of a, a rural background applicant. We audit them some, uh, throughout the sort of course, but that's your sort of first formal legal declaration that you do uh, meet the criteria for a, a rural background. Okay. Once those formalities are in, SATAC will send us the uh, applicant list and you'll be directed to what we call the faculty's application tracking website. Okay. What that is will be a, a portal for you to log in. That's where there'll be bulletin boards. Um, we'll announce the invitations to the oral assessments from there. And if you get an offer, the type of uh, place that you've been offered. So that'll become a very important part of the process sort of after that, that uh, you've put your application into SATAC. Now, a lot of people put their application into SATAC and want to log straight in and see what's going on. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait until after all the applications close at the end of September because it's only then that SATAC will send me the, all the application information that I can load into the tracking system. Okay, so just a bit of patience. We've mentioned that on the front page, login page of the website, but just remember that it, it'll just take a, a little bit to, to get that open. But in plenty of time for you, to, um, for you to sort of follow it through. Okay, so that's the formal SATAC application. Again, the next step, and it'll be announced on that tracking website, will be the oral assessment. So they're like the, they're sort of like interviews. Okay. We actually extend invitations to about 700 students based on your UMAT result. So we get the UMAT results in, match them up with the people who have applied and the highest ranking students will be invited to oral assessments. Um, we will actually only be able to extend those invitations probably... Mm, I'd, it says early to mid-October, I would say probably close to mid-October, you know, we're, we're sort of getting all the information and wanting to make sure we get it 110% correct. So it does take a bit of time. We do have a second round of oral assessments and they're held in the last week of January. So what will happen is the first round of formal offers will come out in the middle of January and then we'll extend this second round invitations and uh, students will uh, sit those oral assessments at the end of January. Okay. Now they're a bit special because we will have your ATARs at that point. So we'll be able to extend those January invitations based on a combination of your uh, UMAT and ATAR, not just your UMAT. Okay. Now uh, a lot of people are planning, I've just had an email this morning, somebody who's planning uh, a bit of a, an exchange program over in Germany in December and wants to know if we can reschedule an oral assessment should he get one. Unfortunately, we can't. It, we just can't accommodate everybody. We have to be quite strict about we will nominate some times. You'll have some flexibility within that, but we can't schedule assessments outside of nominated times. And they all have to be done face-to-face -face here in Adelaide. So you do have to, to be available for them, okay? Now we had a, a sort of changed format and content. Uh, in previous years, we had uh, one really long assessment, uh, but this, this year, as, as we did last year, we uh, will split that into two 15-minute assessments instead of one longer one. And of course, we keep an eye on the content and make sure that's reviewed and up-to-date and current each year. Um, but, you know, whatever the changes are, they may be subtle because overall we're still trying to find in the assessment process what we're looking for basically is a student's capacity to thrive in this student-centred, self-directed learning environment that Professor Burt described. You know, we really do want to know about your decision-making abilities and your problem-solving skills. You know, important in um, such a, a hands-on 
integrated uh, learning style. Of course, your interpersonal and communication skills will be looked at. You'll need, we'll also be looking at how you demonstrate your attention to detail and professional behaviour. And of course, your personal desire and drive to become a doctor. Um, some people, just before I move on to this next one, some people always ask like, oh, what, what should I say in an oral assessment? And to be brutally honest, there is no right or wrong answer. We are absolutely just trying to get to the truth of you to make sure that you're suited to the program, um, that, that you know, you've got a best chance of success uh, in our program. But then, of course, once the assessment's finished, the next step will be, who do we make an offer to? Now, offers that we make are based on a combination of all the scores we have available to us. So we give this one big overall merit ranking score, and it's based, 40% of that will come from the academic grade. So whether that be your ATAR, or a stat result, or a grade point average, That'll contribute 40% to this overall merit ranking score. 40% of it is going to come from your oral assessment score. So how will you do in your oral assessment? Um, and 20% of it will come from the UMAT. Now, that very genuinely is a, com a combination of all of those results. Now, some people find it very disturbing that you know, they got, I don't know, 98 or 90, you know, 90, 99, and their friend who got 95 or 94 got an offer into medicine and they didn't. What, they, what you've really got to understand it is an absolute combination of all of those results. Of course, the better you do in any one or more, the better you'll do, but it's an absolute combination. So if you are lucky enough to get an offer, then the SATAC will release that formal offer to you and then they'll direct you back to the tracking website to see what type of place it is. So it could be that you've got your choice of an unbonded place or a scholarship and a scholarship place, you get to choose. Some people who are lower down on the list may only have one option, like a bonded place. But that tracking website will be where, you know, where you find out what type of place it is that you've been offered. Um, and you need to be very well informed when you, when you accept to make sure that you're comfortable with the sort of conditions if you get offered a bonded place of some sort. Of course, and if you do say yes, and it's going to be exciting if you do, um, there are extra requirements. And now these are all listed on the university's degree finder under the medicine program. But there's a link to what we call the inherent requirements of a medical student. So there are some basic things, you know, that you'll need to be able to do, like, you know, have the, the sort of strength to give somebody CPR or, or, you know, whatever. They're all detailed on the website and absolutely encourage you to, or recommend, not just encourage, recommend that you read through those carefully and just make sure you're kind of up for it and that you have the, the necessary uh, skills required. Things you'll also need to sort of know things like that you need um, to do what they call testing for a prescribed communicable infection. You know, we don't want to put um, you know, patients at risk if you have some uh, infection that may be transmitted between you. Um, you'll also need to do things like make sure you have a first senior first aid certificate before you start the program. These are all listed on the website, but you just really do need to be sure that you're aware there are some extra requirements before you start the course. Okay? Okay. We also, each year, because we try very carefully to hit the exact right number of people in, um, in the medical program each year, we often find that we have to sort of make offers to sort of backfill and top up you know, our numbers each year. So just, if you don't get an offer in the first round, just really keep in the back of your mind, we do continue to make offers right through to the end of February, you know, quite late in the piece. So don't panic if you don't get that first round offer. It doesn't mean you're out of the running altogether just yet, okay? Um, 
there's a lot of information. I really, really strongly encourage you. The best thing, best advice that we can give is to just make sure you're informed. Ask all your questions. There are some wonderful people available out in our tent on the Bar Smith lawns, which is just towards the back of the uni, the back, back entrance. If you go down past the sciences and engineering buildings, you'll see all the marquees out and we'd love to chat to you. Ask us any questions at all. Um, but I'm now going to sort of say, look, that was an awful lot of information, so just take it on board, ask more questions and make sure you're comfortable with the information you'll need. But I will actually now hand back to Professor Burt to, to sort of say a few final words. Really just to say thank you all for coming to this. And as Beverly says, there are a lot of people around um, uh, in the marquees and the Barsmith lawns um, and lots of interesting activities as well. So we have a num uh, quite a number of medical students, academic staff, uh, other staff that work with us. Um, so make the most of this. And if you have any questions, as, as Beverly says, about the detail, there'll be plenty of people around to answer those. So thank you again.